If a baby survives being born early, for many families their problems don't end there. Disability is a major risk. Over a third of cerebral palsy cases are linked to prematurity. The, the connection is that if you're premature, you have more fragile blood vessels in your brain, you're more likely to bleed within your brain, and if you've damaged your brain, you, you can develop cerebral palsy. So it's a, it's, a, it's a risk, a known risk of prematurity. Tickle, tickle, that's it. Wow, that's Finlay! Finlay was born at 31 weeks and five days and has developed cerebral palsy as a result of being premature. He's now four years old. Hi, Hello. nice to meet you. Hi, nice Hi, to meet you. Hi. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm Jew. Thank you. Hello. This is Rafferty. Hi, Rafferty. I think it's um, having a child with a, a disability, you go through probably a, a grieving process. Yeah. Um, you grieve the child um, that you thought was going to be that it, it isn't, you know, yeah, and yes. that is very emotionally draining at times yeah, but I think you have to find some strength in all of that because you know you are that child's parent and that that child needs you and you can't fall to pieces because who's going to look after him then mm. you know you're his mum and you've got to be there for him all the time. As well as the emotional costs of having a disabled child there's a real financial cost too Although there is provision on the NHS for physiotherapy and other services for children with cerebral palsy, Alexa and her husband Paul supplement this by paying over £10,000 a year for private therapies. They feel that the improvement in Finlay is well worth the money. It's a slow process and it is one day at a time, but I think he's done remarkably well to get where he is. And I think that his paediatrician is absolutely delighted with the progress that he's actually made. You know, a lot of people when they hear, oh, premature baby, they just think small. Yeah. You know, they don't think, uh, well, yeah, small, but also potentially things wrong, you know, because, because depending at what stage you have the baby, things aren't quite as developed as they should be at that point. To have a child with additional needs is, a, not a, in terms of not a Finlay, it's a horrendous experience because you just want to a wave a magic wand and say... I want everything to be OK. In your opinion, do you think enough's been done to prevent premature birth? I'd say that from what I've read, the number of premature births is on the up. Yeah. So potentially that means that there's more families that are going to have a child with cerebral palsy or, you know, other additional needs. And I think that, yes, there mm. does need to be more research done to see what can be done to prevent this happening. Mm. Because the implications are massive. Yeah. You know... Finlay is always going to have difficulties in, in his life. And as a mum, you know, if you could have prevented that happening, yeah. then you would do because you, d you wouldn't choose this for mm. him. You know, yeah, I so true. would want to wish that everything is going to be OK. And I know it is going to be OK because he's got us and we love him to bits. But, you know, you don't want your child to have difficulties that potentially mm. may have been avoided or if they did invest a little bit more time yeah. and do more research that to stop other families having to go through what we've had to go through because I wouldn't wish this on anybody. Mm. Oh, come here. I think I've just learnt so much from meeting, uh, from meeting Alexa and, and Finlay. And I, you know, even before I went there, I didn't realise that there was a link between premature birth and cerebral palsy. Obviously what happened to me is terrible and I'll probably never get over it. But she's grieving as well in a, in a different way. Grieving for the child that she thought she was going to have. So it is a life-changing problem. You know, some of us lose our babies. Some of us have babies that have, you know, terrible disabilities that they're going to need care all their lives. Like Alexa, I was worried about the lack of research, so I'm at St Thomas's Hospital to meet Professor Poston, who has been examining saliva samples from pregnant women and testing their hormones. It's early days and there may be limitations to the research, but the results seem promising. We found that in the saliva of those women who had the very early babies, that there was a very low concentration of the, of the pregnancy hormone progesterone. 
And other people have looked for this hormone in the blood and they haven't really found anything very conclusive. But mm. if you look for it in the saliva, it sort of hasn't got any other hormones around to, to interact with it. And it gives a sort of pure preparation. And it was really low compared with people who had a normal delivery. Right. But it has potential for being a, a new test for prediction of women who are going to develop very early deliveries. But securing funding for research in this area is tough. The government don't identify a specific pot of money for this type of research project. Professor Poston's initial test was actually funded by the baby charity Tommy's. Do you think, in general, there's enough money ploughed into research? No, no. no. it's really, really difficult. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of an orphan subject. I mean, that's a pretty useful word, isn't it, <laughs> when you're talking about prematurity? Yeah. But it is an orphan subject, and. I think most people think, well, pregnancy is just nine months of people's lives and most people have completely normal pregnancies. Well, if you mm. work like I do in a high-risk unit, that's mm. not the case. Of course, we have hundreds and thousands of women who are affected, mm. either by premature labour or preeclampsia, mm. have small babies. The cost to the health service is, is huge. I was surprised to learn about the lack of funding for research into prematurity. And I was even more surprised to learn that there's almost a 3,000 shortfall in neonatal nurses across the UK. The most important issue that underlies all of the problems that we've seen in, in neonatal care for the last 20 years is staffing, both nursing and medical staffing. Um, so whether it's transport, not having enough staff to be able to, to man a transport service, whether it's uh, having enough nurses on the front line to provide um, care to the family or direct clinical care to the baby, um, that's all underpinned by, by having enough staff on the ground. I always feel, this is my personal opinion and some professional opinion, that maternity is a little bit of a Cinderella in the NHS. It's not, it's not target driven, it doesn't have a waiting list. I think we don't substitute the um, NHS, but we do a lot without people like us to support. There mm. are gaps. Mm. I just think we've got an overburdened NHS and yeah. not enough funding. And I think there should be more priority in maternity. Mm. It's the start of life. You know, yeah, sure. they should be given the best in life. Despite the growing rates of premature birth, the Department of Health say that Britain is one of the safest places in the world to give birth and that maternity is a priority for them. It says an extra 4,000 midwives are being recruited. Nevertheless, I wanted to meet a family affected by staff shortages, so today I'm in Dewsbury to meet Elaine and her little boy Jack. Hi, how are you doing? Come in. Right, how are you? Hello. Bye. Hi. Hello. Elaine gave birth to Jack at just 29 weeks in February this year, just a day after I had my little boy, Archie. But once Jack was born, he was shifted around between four hospitals in 10 days. What was the reason that they kept moving him? Did they? <laughs> well, <laughs> just... Um, they moved him from Bradford because he was a Dewsbury baby and, and the staff wanted him to be closer to home. Yeah. Dewsbury weren't allowed to look after babies that were on high dependency care. Mm. Um, so he, he had to be moved to Jimmy's, closest place with a bed for him. Um, once he'd been into Jimmy's, they didn't have a low dependency unit at the, at there, so then he moved to Pontefract, <gasps> where they've got both. And is it so. right that they had the beds, but they didn't have the staff? Yeah, yeah, they had the beds, but they, they've got all the stuff, but they just haven't got the staff. So what changes would you like to see made? What changes would have made things easier for you? Um, the main change would have been, well, would be the high dependency staff and mm. um, support staff as well, because you sort of left in a room waiting for other consultants to come around, not knowing anything with all these questions in your head. And then, just like you said, more research on why, you know, prematurity happens, basically, yeah. you know. Yeah. Jack is a healthy and happy nine-month-old baby, and despite the trauma of hospital moves, Elaine was happy with the care he received. The Mid-Yorkshire Hospital's NHS Trust told us that the decisions to transfer baby Jack were taken in his best interests, to ensure he received the right level of specialist care as close to home as possible, and that like other hospitals, they have a specific number of specialist cots available, and there are times when all these cots are being used. 